What is going on team? Welcome back to another video. If you are new here, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jim Galvin and on this channel we cover all things training, nutrition, biohacking and ancestral living to help you guys work out what you need to do based on your own individual biology to help improve and optimize your performance, your health and your physique. I would kind of class myself in generality as a hybrid athlete, basically because I'm usually chasing an improvement in a strength pursuit and an endurance pursuit as well. But considering a big part of my background as being a 100 meter sprinter, a decathlete and a full time international bobsled athlete, I kind of recognize that there is this enormous flipping gap in speed and power development in a lot of kind of conventional fitness industry pursuits. In a lot of hybrid training work, in military preparation work, in CrossFit and functional fitness. Obviously there are speed and power elements to it, but I think a lot of the very important nuances are missing. So today, this is basically episode one in a short series where I'm gonna walk you through how to develop speed and power in your gym training and your lifting. And today we are looking at it through the lens of an upper body session. So coming up, you can see some stuff like this. And you can see some stuff like that because I've actually already filmed the session. However, at the beginning of the session, my microphone is not working. So my gorgeous, incredibly comprehensive, artistic, poetic, articulate introduction was kind of lost a little bit, which is why I'm doing it again today. But in essence, that is what we're gonna be doing. I'm gonna be showing you how to tweak a couple of the tiny little details of an upper body gym session in an attempt to develop power, whilst also developing the strength that we are trying to, whilst also maintaining an engine. And it's actually pretty flipping simple to do. So we're gonna make sure that we are gonna develop that power without compromising the development of those other the components and characteristics. And we'll get onto that in about 30 seconds, but very quickly, I want to explain why this is such a big component of my content and probably has been for the last year. And it's basically because of this. Speed and power output is one of the foundational components of human performance. It transfers to pretty much everything. Even long distance running, literally, even if you're doing a marathon, running in that way with that cadence, running is effectively a sequence of very short jumps. So if you develop an increased level of power output and the dynamic and ballistic nature of our tissues and they can work appropriately and effectively in that way, upper body strength movements and lower body strength movements, we continue to teach our body to keep accelerating through the extension of a particular movement. It does in theory make everything else more effective and efficient. And the way that I'm gonna walk you through this upper body session today, I want you to imagine there are four different components, four different sections to the session. And obviously we're gonna start with section one. And after a quick warm up, guys, which again effectively has a little bit of kind of general warming, three to five minutes on some erg kit and some stretching and mobility and a little bit of dynamic movement, we move on to section one of today's session, which is the power primer. Power primers are much more common in lower body sessions, but I wanna show you today what one of these might look like for an upper body session. Power primer is basically kind of the link between uh, the end of the warm up and kind of the main start of the lifting session. It's something that is very light, it is something that is very fast, and it's just enough volume that it's innovating you. So that connection, that central nervous system connection right between your brain and your muscle tissues, we wanna innovate that as much as possible. So we wanna get used to that movement, we wanna start moving nice and quick, nice and explosively, and we want enough volume in our primer that it does that but not too much volume that it starts to elicit a little bit of fatigue and exhaustion. So there is a fine balance here. If you've got a good priming movement, which I'll show you in a second, a set of about five and then about 60 seconds break and then a set of five again is probably enough. Two to three sets of five is good enough for a primer. And today's primer is a medicine ball throw. And a lot of the time when we throw, our lower body, our legs and hip drive is always gonna be significantly stronger than our upper body. So we tend to use that and kind of utilize that as much as possible to kick in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna do this from my knees today, as you are seeing here, to deactivate the lower body. And what this means is all force generated is from the upper body. It really isolates that horizontal push movement which is exactly what I want to do. So I'm just getting into a nice balanced position. I'm leaning forward and then once I kind of pass that point of no return, I explode as hard as I can, throwing the medicine ball towards a little plyo box, getting back up, recovering the ball, and again, doing about five of these before I take a short break and then five more. And the reason that we do this, guys, you imagine that you're doing a heavy bench press, even if it is a one rep max and you get a PB and it's the heaviest you've ever lifted, Effectively, you're pushing past the sticking point and then what you're doing is you're decelerating. You're actually slowing down as you kind of finish the extension of the elbow. What we're doing with this, because it's a throw, is we are teaching our body to continue to accelerate through that movement. So instead of just slowing down at the end, we're not just taking the medicine ball to the end of the movement, we're continuing to accelerate. Just in the way that standing up would become jumping if you accelerated through it, effectively, 
horizontal pushing would become throwing when you continue to accelerate for the upper body. Section one done and in the bag guys, hope you are on the flipping edge of your seat. What we are gonna do now is revert back to the rest of the video when my microphone had in fact sufficiently charged. So Jim Galvin from two days ago, over to you. Okay, so primer done, that is section one. Section two, we are onto the main compound lift of the day. Keeping it super simple and transferable, all we're gonna do is we're gonna do some flat bench today, but probably say at this juncture, and this should be fairly obvious, and anyone that's trying to tell you to develop a certain component in any way, that says it can be done with implementing a single methodology is probably flipping line to you. So there's a couple of different methodologies and vehicles that we can use. And I think effectively the best way to, to develop power whilst continuing to develop strength, whilst continuing to develop a little bit of lean muscle mass and not compromise your engine, which again is kind of the goal of the hybrid athlete, right? Is to rotate through a few different variables. So with flat bench, say we're sticking around four reps. We don't really need to change the rep scheme going from strength development to power development. We just need to change the way the movement itself is executed. So I've got written down here, as an example, through the course of a month, one week, so week one, we could do on flat bench, just one set or one set, sorry, one week of effectively just doing normal sets of four, whatever your eccentric tempo is, probably around three seconds-ish, straight off the chest, and then basically snapping up, exploding up as quick as you can. That is the way that most people would execute a set of four. So you could do four sets of four, five sets of four, six, whatever it may be. But effectively the way that you execute it is just as standard. And then the following week, week two, when you're doing your bench session, what you're doing is you're basically doing it with pauses. Eccentric volume around about three seconds, again, nice and controlled. And then it doesn't really need to be on the chest that long. In my opinion, one second, two seconds is more than enough. Just enough that we effectively take the stretch reflex out so we're not bouncing it off. So down, control, you can breathe out and then re-breathe back in, what's called the re-breathe, hold it again and push, or you can just go down until it contacts the chest, hold it there for a fraction of a second and then up. Again, it doesn't need to be on there for two, three seconds in my opinion. I don't know how much of an extra benefit you get from that. All it's doing is kind of fatiguing you in that position, but just long enough that it takes the bounce and stretch reflex out. That's week two. Moving on to week three, now you see we're starting to get the bands involved now. Bands, resistance bands and chains, not many high street gyms have chains, far more have bands, which is why we're using them today. Work with what's called your natural strength curve. That basically means that we, are, that we get stronger the closer we get to extension at any particular movement. So we are stronger there than we are in that kind of that mid range. That's why everyone's sticking point is usually around the same point. So what we're doing is we're making, we're basically creating an environment where there's a little bit more resistance at the top. The closer you get to finishing the movement, the band is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, therefore offering more resistance. So the amount that you're pushing from the bottom to the top is probably a good kind of, depending on the bands you use, maybe about an extra, anywhere between eight and 15 kilos heavier at the top. So that's week three, kind of nice and dynamic, but pushing with the bands from there. And then week four, the fourth and final way that we can manipulate the variables and the way that we execute the bench to make sure that we're developing power while still getting stronger, while still getting bigger, while still maintaining our engine and capacity, is bands with pauses. So basically down, under control, brief pause again, and there it's something called RFD, rate of force development. So you've got to overcome the inertia of that initial weight in your chest, keep pushing up, same as a normal bench, you're executing it in the same way, but it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier towards the top. Your brain starts to learn this, so what it does is it creates this kind of construct in your mind, in your central nervous system, that you don't slow down towards the top of a movement, that you keep accelerating. So again, to highlight as a quick summary, week one, we've got standard sets of four and bench press. Week two, we've got exactly the same weight, but with pauses, maybe a little bit lighter because of the pauses. Week three, we've got introducing bands, but nice and dynamically, kind of as quick as, obviously control it on the way down, but driving up on that transition as quick as possible. And then week four, the fourth and final week on this particular rotation, down under control, pause on the chest, and then up from there, but once again, with bands. So on a four week rotation, four different ways, of executing exactly the same movement with the exact same rep scheme, but you're just changing the eccentric tempo a little bit, we're changing the way that we execute the concentric, we're changing the speed, the amount of time that it's on the chest, and the amount of total resistance with the use of the bands. Right guys, so now moving on to section three, which is the push-pull superset. Again, referring to my notes down here, so we have basically two moves, a push exercise and a pull exercise, and effectively, I'm trying to execute them almost in the same way. I would say personally that for power development, once you get over the rep range of about five or six, up to like sevens to, you know, 12s or 15s or 20s or whatever, you're very much working in a hypertrophic window. And using bands, so band resistant stuff, again, working with the natural strength curve, can be super effective to get an extra little bit of like tissue perfusion, so you basically get more 
oxygenated, nutrient-filled blood to the tissues that you want, getting worked at the top end. But realistically, you're not really gonna develop maximum power doing a set of eight of anything. So eight to 12. And what I did is I did a band-resisted contralateral single arm overhead, it's easy to say. <laughs> and then effectively a banded kettlebell row with a slightly stronger band, which didn't really offer that much resistance at the bottom, 24 kilos in each hand. But then by the time I'm getting to the top, I'm really having to make sure that I accelerate through the pull movement and really drive my elbow back to try and get kind of my thumb to my bottom rib and my thumb to uh, somewhere between my bottom rib and my hips, depending on kind of how you want your lats to work. So push and pull, two different exercises, supersets, so three or four rounds. I would keep the rest periods as you normally do when you're doing a little bit of recreational functional bodybuilding. And in terms of the speed that you actually execute the rep, I'd keep it pretty much the same as well. The only thing I would literally do to change, to hack this, to make it consistent and congruent with power development is purely to introduce the band. So one thin band kind of like lanyarded round a dumbbell for the overhead and one thicker band kind of lanyarded round both of the kettlebells for the row. Three rounds of any over between eight and 12 and it is all gravy and without even knowing it, you are again grooving that movement pattern. You're kind of building that, uh, that mechanism in your brain to make sure that it continues to accelerate through movements all the time and that is an incredibly useful seal to have in any game, in any sport, in any pursuit, in any kind of area of fitness. And that's what we're focusing on today and introducing bands in this way is definitely gonna help it for that third section, which is basically a naturally hypertrophic push-pull superset. And moving on to section four, the fourth and final section of the session, guys. And this is where we basically go into a little bit more kind of classic functional recreational bodybuilding stuff with the numbers that we're working and basically a heavy circuit, which effectively is a good little finisher regardless of the main objective. Again, the higher up the rep range that you go, the less likely you are to develop power. But what I've done is I basically used today's heavy circuit finisher with resistance bands only, in fact, no weights. So what I'm gonna do is put one light resistance band in each hand to make sure that I find a point along the band that there's still tension at the bottom. But then I raise and from there from when it's kind of out from when the arms are out and pretty much parallel to the ground it's fairly challenging and I'm not able to go that much higher between 10 and 15 reps of that and then with very little break between 10 to 20 reps of banded bicep curl again there's not going to be an awful lot of resistance at the bottom but you're but you're teaching your body to continue to accelerate all the way up getting more and more and more blood perfusion into the tissues definitely amazing way to get a flipping arm pump is just resistance band stuff. And then I'm gonna lanyard the same band to the pull-up bar and do 10 to 20 tricep extensions. Naturally, your inner pecs are gonna try and kick in and bring your hands together. And that's gonna happen, but every time that starts to happen and you feel your knuckles start to contact, just try and catch it, be aware, and move your hands a little bit further out to make sure that you're deactivating the chest and effectively isolating pretty much only the triceps for that movement. So there we go, guys. Four different sections of today's hybrid upper power session. The first one is a primer, kind of extension of the warm up, basically to innovate you as much as possible for what's to come. That's super flipping important. The second section is the main compound lift of the session. And I walked you guys, if we were doing four reps on bench press as an example, how you could work on a four week rotation with standard flat bench, flat bench with pauses, flat bench with a band, and then band and pauses on the week four, and then effectively go back to week one. Two rounds of that, so eight weeks in total, will be a good little cycle before you take a deload and maybe test. Section three is where we're doing our functional hypertrophy superset. Still working a little bit on power, so still weighted with dumbbells and kettlebells and barbells and things. But adding light resistance bands as an extra little variable to make sure that we increase tissue perfusion again with a little bit more blood flow to the area. And again, making sure that we speed up the movement as it goes through. And then the fourth and final section is basically just a little finisher as you would if you were doing a strength session or a powerlifting session or whatever it may be with a slightly higher rep range. Hope you did enjoy that, beautiful people. If you did, please do smash that like button. It only takes you two seconds, but it really makes my day. And it makes Elliot's day, doesn't it, Elliot? It makes my day. It makes his day. If you have not yet done so, please make sure you subscribe. We have a hell of a lot of awesome content on the way over the next few months. And as always, beautiful people, stay strong, stay healthy, stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next video.